when I was 13. Uh, my family moved to Illinois, just down the road from Fermilab, the large particle accelerator in the center of the country. And that's where I wanted to work. All I wanted to be was a particle physicist. And I worked single-mindedly toward that goal for 13 years. And I got my PhD in 1999. And I said to myself, I didn't want to be a particle physicist anymore. Because what I found most interesting was the detector, the technology. And the technology of particle detectors has barely changed since the 70s. So I went looking for the next big machine. Uh, and I found it in this new field that was called gravitational wave astronomy. And now I will really tell you what that's about. So, imagine space is a large, flat, elastic sheet. I take a marble, I roll it along that sheet. It's going to travel in a nice straight line. Newton's law of inertia. Things in motion stay in motion. But now I'm going to take a heavy object. Let's pretend a bowling ball. And I'm going to sit it in the center of that sheet. Now it's going to bend downward where the heavy object is sitting on it. If I now take a marble and roll it across this sheet, it's naturally going to follow the curvature that's been introduced into that sheet. Very much like those large funnels in shopping malls that you put coins into and they roll around the side of the funnel. Right? If you were riding along that coin, you would think you were going in a nice straight line, but you're not because macroscopically, Space isn't flat anymore. Space is curved. This is, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, a geometric picture of what gravity is. Gravity is not heavy objects reaching out and pulling other things towards them. Gravity is heavy objects distort and curve the space around them, so things naturally want to go in curved paths when they are nearby. Now take that one step further. Take the bowling ball, and start moving it around in a circle. And imagine you're standing nearby. As the bowling ball approaches, space is going to curve. And then as it moves to the other side, space is going to snap back to normal. And this undulating change is going to radiate outward in all directions, as if you had thrown a rock into a pond. That radiating wave is called a gravitational wave. And in three dimensions, what it means to curve space is that the distance between two objects is actually stretching and shrinking. If one of these waves passed through this room, the distance between you and I would be moving like this. Now, the simplest and largest of events that we can think of that would create waves like this are what we call inspiraling black holes. Two black holes are traveling along, and they bump into each other on the street and get caught in each other's mutual gravitational pull. So as they go by, they will start spiraling around their mutual center. That is a system that will give off these gravitational waves. But space doesn't want to bend, so that takes energy. So as these black holes lose energy, they will fall towards each other. As they get closer, they will spin around each other more quickly, like a figure skater pulling their arms into their body. That will make the frequency of the waves increase. Also, as they get closer, the motion gets more violent, and the size of the waves, the amplitude, will increase. By the time the black holes finally collide with each other, they will be orbiting around a couple hundred times per second, which is a number I never feel gets sufficient awe, those are audio frequencies. Now, you can't hear space, but if you could put that wave into an audio speaker, you would hear it increasing in frequency or pitch, and you would hear it increasing in amplitude or volume. So it would sound something like whoop. So we call it a chirp. The problem is, if two black holes in spiraled and collided with each other, let's say not in our galaxy, because that would be bad, but let's say the next cluster of galaxies away, it should warp the distance between objects on Earth by one in one followed by 21 zeros, which is kind of a meaningless number. So the best analogy I have heard is it's equivalent to the distance between the Earth and the Sun vibrating back and forth by the width of an atom. 
And that is a huge signal. So how could we ever measure something that small? Well, let's just pretend we could for a moment. Let's take as our ruler for measuring space light. I'm going to take a laser beam and I'm going to split it so that it travels in two perpendicular directions. And I want it to travel as far as possible because the more space I measure, the bigger the effect. So I'm going to make two big tunnels as straight and long as the curvature of the Earth will allow before it drops out from underneath us. That's about four kilometers, a little under two and a half miles. Not good enough. So to increase the length, I'm going to have the light bounce back and forth several hundred times. Now it's traveling thousands of kilometers. Now when it comes back, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that light is a wave. And depending on how far those two beams of light travel, different things could happen. If they come back what we call in phase, both waves are rising and falling at the same time, then when I superimpose them, they will add together and give me an even brighter beam of light. But if they come back out of phase, one rises when the other falls, and vice versa, then they will actually annihilate each other. And when superimposed, I will get no light. The difference between the two is only half the length of the wave, which for visible light is on the order of a couple of hundred nanometers, less than a hundredth of the width of a human hair. Still not good enough. But if I could tell the difference between lots of light and no light with very sensitive electronics to one part in 10 billion, then I could measure what we're looking for. Now this was known as far back as the mid-70s. When I was an undergraduate, I took a class about this, and we thought it was a big joke. Oh, that's insane. That'll never happen. And then I went, and I got my PhD, and then I was trying to find something new to do, and I visited a friend of mine who had worked on this as an undergraduate, and I said, whatever happened to that crazy thing? And he said, oh, didn't you know? They built it. <laughs> this is LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, because LIGO doesn't sound as good. There are two of them. This one is in Washington State. The other one is in Livingston, Louisiana, just a short seven and a half hour drive east of here. And both of them were completed one month before I finished my PhD. Well, this is the biggest, baddest machine there is. So how do I get involved in this project when I've done nothing remotely similar to it? First problem, get a job. Since the observatories were newly finished, everyone was moving to the observatories to start getting them to work. The problem with that is, especially if you're new, you get specialized in one subsystem, you are responsible for making that subsystem work, but you don't really learn the project as a whole. However, on Caltech campus was a 1 100th scale prototype called the 40 meter laboratory. That was what people used to prove you could actually make this work. And that's how the buckets of government funding started coming in. That was just sitting there. Everyone had left it abandoned. So I went to the director and I said, let me rebuild your entire prototype while you're working on the observatories. So when you get tired of that and want to make the next generation of the instrument, this is all ready to go. And so I did that for four years. And by 2003, when people started trickling back, I had rebuilt every subsystem of the instrument from scratch. And so now I could come to Trinity and build whatever I want. <laughs> but then we run into problem number two, which is that here at Trinity University, I do not have an army of graduate students and postdocs. Normally, that's a good thing. But if I want to work on a real critical path problem, Someone who does have an army of graduate students and postdocs is going to finish first. But if I work on something that's not important, no one's going to fund me for it. Why pay me to do something nobody cares about? The trick is to find that happy medium. And so I had a plan. I spent a summer at MIT helping, but mostly nosing around, asking questions, making a nuisance of myself trying to find something that they considered a problem, but not enough of a problem to actually divert resources to. And this is what I came up with. This is one of the mirrors. 
in LIGO. They are absolutely huge. They are isolated in every possible way from the environment. They are in a vacuum. They are hanging from wires to filter out the vibration of the ground such that there is nothing environmental that can make them move. However, for various reasons, excess electrical charge can still find its way to the surface. And here's where the isolation works against you because there's nothing to get rid of it. And if that charge moves around at all, it changes the electric field between the optic and all the surrounding metal suspension frame, which applies a little torque, which gives it a little wobble on the atomic scale. But again, we're measuring something so small that that's enough to drown your signal in static. So I came back to Trinity. I grabbed undergraduate Bobby McKinney. And for $850, we made a little sensor that could detect electric charge. We rubbed some rubber on one of the optics, and we saw a little mountain of charge that slowly spread out over a period of weeks. And we published that in March 2006. In April of 2006, there was an earthquake in Kamchatka, which all the risk players know where that is. And that knocked one of the mirrors in the Louisiana interferometer out of alignment and caused it to get electrostatically stuck against its suspension frame, as if you took a balloon and rubbed it against your hair and stuck it on the wall. They let a little air into the chamber. That took the charge away. The mirror swung free. But when they started running the system again, a previously unexplained noise source had disappeared. Charging was a problem now. And so they said, who is working on this problem? So sometimes it is better to be lucky than good. All of a sudden, I had my own little cottage industry. Just because I had this nine-month head start, this has been how I've managed to keep myself a part of this big science experiment by measuring how much noise the charge contributes, how to get rid of it, what materials to choose so it doesn't build up in the first place. And while I've been doing this for a decade, LIGO ran off and on from 2005 to 2010, and saw nothing. And then from 2010 to 2015, everything was replaced. The mirrors, the time went into making the system a factor of 10 times more sensitive. And it was turned on in September of 2015. And approximately 48 hours later, those two signals were seen in the Hanford, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana interferometers seven milliseconds apart. Whoop! It's a very innocuous looking graph, but what you are looking at are two black holes, 29 and 36 times the mass of our sun, in the last few tenths of a second of life before they collide with each other 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. It is the most violent event ever detected. While this collision occurred, this gave off 50 times more energy than all the rest of the observable universe combined. Now, since then, we've detected almost a dozen such events. My favorite is one was not black holes, but neutron stars, extremely dense stars that are not quite heavy enough to become black holes. But the nice thing is light can escape from them. But while the gravitational waves shoot right out, when they collide at the center of the collision, the electromagnetic radiation that is formed has to scatter its way out of the extremely dense stars. And that can take hours to days. But it eventually arrives, is detected by a multitude of telescopes in the same region of the sky. Both an elegant proof that we're seeing something real and Establishing LIGO is an early warning system for saying, hey, Hubble Telescope, look over there. Something really cool is about to happen. And so this is a good a time as any to talk about why are we doing this? What value do we get from this? Well, number one, you never know what kind of object we're going to find. Number two, we've learned that there are many more massive black holes in the sky than we thought. There are models of cosmology, the formation of the universe, for which there are not enough black holes formed for two to ever just randomly bump into each other. Those models are wrong. 
and must be adjusted to take into account these two measurements. But the real reason we do basic science like this is we just never know in advance. For all we know, the technology we invent to measure these things is going to lead to some advance in another field. The parts of relativity we've never tested but can now directly observe might tell us something useful in ways we never imagined. So I want to wrap up this story in two ways. Number one, an entirely new field of astronomy has been created in your lifetime, really within the last four years. And this isn't the end, this is the beginning. There are versions of this that are going to be launched into space. There are versions that operate off of measuring pulsar pulses as they reach the Earth. This is the time to get interested in this field. And the other thing I want to mention is, does anyone in the audience who's considering a career change? <laughs> If you have a plan, if you have a persistence, it's never too late. My PhD advisor, when he was 85 years old, the particle physics lab he'd worked at for half his life became the Kavli Institute for Astrophysics. And I asked him, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I guess I'm going to learn some astrophysics. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs>